Okay, chapter 23. This is the last chapter in the seventh edition uh, certified personal training textbook, NASM's uh, seventh edition textbook. Last chapter, and it's on chronic health conditions and special populations. Now, just keep in mind uh, what NASM has basically done is given, given all the information in the previous chapters and focused for the most part on uh, apparently healthy individuals. And so appropriately enough, the last chapter here is going to speak to those, uh, those individuals, those special populations and those individuals with chronic health conditions. This is a very, very important chapter uh, because for the most part, what we're finding um, more and more often is that our clients in general, the general population um, has chronic health conditions at some level or another, uh, whether it be whether it be mild pre-hypertension, all the way to uh, full-blown um, obesity and full-blown diabetes, or or lung issues, uh, coronary artery disease, things like this. So, you know, this final chapter is really designed to help to help you to understand that um, outside of that population of apparently healthy individuals who already have issues, right? musculoskeletal issues, the, you know, the uh, distortion, postural distortion syndromes, all of those things that apparently healthy people have is one thing. Uh, but when you move into chronic health conditions, right, in special populations, uh, this requires a, a little, a little special, you know, knowledge base and skill set. And so that's really what you need to know in chapter 23. Keep in mind, Scope of practice is critical when you're going through this material. You always got to keep that in the back of your mind. We are not diagnosing. We are not, um, we're not medical practitioners. So it's not like we are going to cure the chronic disease. Remember, chronic diseases are those diseases that uh, last longer than six months. And generally, you're not curing them. They're being managed if they are being managed, right? So you got to keep that in mind, that chronic health conditions, special populations, we're seeing more and more of that. So it's important to uh, keep this in mind and certain special populations are age related, right? So here we start with um, physiological differences between children and adults. And, and remember um, in this chapter in particular, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, this is gonna be your best friend because for the most part, uh, rewriting the tables is really what the majority of this chapter is gonna be about because this is uh, probably of all the chapters in the book, this has the, one of the one of the highest number of tables in the entire chapter, and um, and the reason that is is because basically this is standardized information that you basically have to memorize. You have to understand it, but it's a lot of memorization. So as we move through the chapter, you're going to notice I'm basically just going to be saying, "Here it is. It's right in the table." Of course, read the text, but you're going to find it's going to be a lot easier to to rewrite the tables and the information in the tables. Look, just like we've talked about in previous chapters, um, it's going to be a more efficient, efficient study and practice. If you look at the tables, which are designed to compress, compile information into a systematic formal way um, and try to rewrite those and, and try to memorize them like that. That's the way I do it uh, and it works really well. So. When we get to uh, when we get to the physiological differences between children and adults, um, Table 23.1 basically gives you a compilation of uh, the considerations and things you would have to things that are comparable, things that are quite different between youth and adults. And why is that the case, right? So considerations for um, health and fitness, as well as considerations for sports. So if you're training high school athletes or middle school athletes, you know, there are things that you have to take into account. Then there's the issue of resistance training for youth. And there are guidelines for training, training youth. Just keep in mind that, that as with adults, you know, there's big differences between 13 year olds, right? Cer certain 13 year olds have matured very quickly. Others have not. There are, there are 13 year old uh, boys who are already very mature physically compared to a 15 year old. And you know this, if you've, if you've, um, you know, if you got kids or if you can't even remember yourself from high school, there was always late bloomers and there were, 
you know, I remember, I remember friends of mine um, in middle school that were already shaving. I mean, it was a uh, Right, quite bizarre. So there is that difference, but there are some basic, basic guidelines for youth training. And then there's the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Page 763, older adult. And again, you know, there's a lot of review here, arterial sclerosis, um, uh, issues related to osteoporosis for older, for older adults um, in particular. Um, you're getting a little bit of review again. Does the word proprioception mean anything? Sure, you've seen it about 10 times already throughout these different chapters. So here's a little bit of review. And as we're looking for older adults, we have to take into account um, you know, some of the things that are related to dealing with uh, people as they age. And here's a little bullet point on page 764, maximal attainable heart rate, all of these things are going to decrease as you as you age. Cardiac output goes down. And so these are the things that you would want to write. And uh, by the way, it's intuitive. I mean, as people get older, you would imagine physical capacity goes down. And what are indicators of physical capacity? Cardiac output, muscle mass, right? Balancing all of these things all the way down to um, anabolic hormone levels, right? Testosterone levels decrease in men, of course. Uh, um, and insulin sensitivity decreases. There are all of these issues that we have to take into account when we're dealing with older adults. And of course, uh, the, the next two tables, three and four, 23, three and four, uh, give you the considerations for physiological training considerations and basic exercise guidelines. Now we did that for the youth and here it is for the adults. Again, these are generalities. There are older adults who are in incredible condition. And you can train them, you can train some 70 year olds the way you would train a 30 year old. I mean, there's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So that, remember with all this, you wanna memorize it of course, but just keep in mind in the real world, everybody's different. And we, um, we always, we always abide by the unique um, physical attributes, variables, biomechanics of the, of the individual. Okay, now we get into chronic chronic health conditions and obesity is, um, you know, is the, uh, is the main one that we look at. Um, obesity has a, a BMI of 30 or greater, and there are different, different levels, uh, categories of, um, of obesity. There's, uh, obesity, then obesity two, and then obesity three, and that's related to BMI. You've seen that chart before. What are the causes of obesity? Um, I'd be a little careful to give just the one, what people think is, well, they eat too much. Mm, sorry, that's not really the case. Um, there's a lot of different variables that go into obesity. Um, and there's a lot of new, a lot of research coming out and telling us quite a bit more about it. So we have to be a little careful in, in what we think is the cause um, of obesity. It's generally not one thing, but irrespective of that, obesity is, is a chronic condition that needs to be brought to, um, to, the, uh, to the trainer for, so that we can help uh, individuals exercise and, you know, and then they need to see a registered dietitian, nutritionist, so that they can get uh, nutritional advice on eating things like that, but they need to exercise. And that's what, um, that's what you're looking at here, ways to do it so that you don't, uh, don't create more problems um, for people that are obese, psychosocial aspects of working with obese, uh, clients, the development of adherence. By the way, with uh, special populations like this, there's that one word that is critical and it's rapport. If you can develop rapport with people that are overweight and obese, you are you have a real good shot at helping them to um, to maintain consistency in their in their training for long term uh, weight loss, which is what we're looking for. So again, table twenty three six twenty three seven are the obesity tables. Um, look through them. They're all basically the same mode, frequency, intensity, basic guidelines. You're going to notice some similarities. Uh, my, uh, my recommendation is that when you write all these out, take a look at them, put them together and go, you know, it looks like the frequency for obese patients is very similar to diabetes. You're going to see a lot of similarities. Um, you'll see more similarities and you'll see differences. So the next one is diabetes. And as we go through, as we go through, um, or as you're going through each of these sections, look at the disease, chronic disease, um, illness, look at it 
understand it. Um, and then look what the exercise guidelines are. Again, in, um, I don't tell you often in the other chapters, but in these chapters in particular, it's really good to look at the training tip box, okay? Now look, when you go through the other chapters, read through everything, obviously, but really hone in in this chapter in particular on the training tips is very good information. And here, of course, the next grouping of tables tells you about diabetes and the considerations you need to take um, for somebody with diabetes. Remember, you are, you are dealing with the physician first. You're not just doing this off the cuff. People that have that are clinically uh, clinically diagnosed with diabetes are on insulin. If they're not on insulin, they have specialized other meds, metformin, things like that that they're using. You would know all of this, and you would want to make sure that you are following the guidelines of the physician first. Okay, don't go looking on the internet or reading. You know the best way to no 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 no. You go by what the doctors and the physicians um, the guidelines tell you to do it, hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Again, a little bit of review uh, on, the, um, on the numbers, 120 over 80. Normal blood pressure is less than, it's not 120 over 80, it is basically 119 over 79 and lower. Um, just get that memorized, this way you're, you're not taken by surprise on the, on the test question. And of course, the um, the training the training uh, considerations, right? Table twenty three ten. Once again, read those tables, read through it, um, and and be um, you know be comfortable and confident that you know the material. Which means you're going to have to look at it and rewrite it over and over. I know in in some cases you can use um, you know you can use flashcards for this. There's nothing again. Flashcards are fine. Use them if they if they help you. But again, it's the reading and rewriting that's really critical. Um, and then, of course, table uh, 2311, hypertension. So that takes care of hypertension and some of the uh, guidelines, uh, guidelines, exercise guidelines. And there are there are um, a number of things you have to keep in mind. People with high blood pressure, especially if they are on the typical high blood pressure meds, okay, like beta blockers and um, AIDS inhibitors, okay? So you've got to know those things, obviously. Coronary um, heart disease as well now. We're, look, we're, we're really into an, an arena, an area, an arena that you gotta be very, very careful. Somebody that has, that has had a heart attack or you know, myocardial infarction, somebody that's had that, they've been through their doctor, they're, they're working with, uh, with a cardiac specialist, they're doing all the heavy lifting with their with their patient. You're following up and, and assuring that the type of training you're doing with them is going to benefit um, and assist with what the clinical side of the house is doing, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, table 2313, you've seen before. And of course, exercise guidelines. People with osteoporosis or osteopenia uh, obviously need to do resistance training, but you gotta be careful, right? And that's why we have some of the guidelines here um, when, you're, when you're training people. Again, osteoporosis is a clinically diagnosed issue, okay? Resistance training can help it as long as an individual is getting enough calcium in their diet, um, they are taking the appropriate um, medicine that if, if they are on medication, and again, following the guidelines of the of the medical profession. Of course, you got to be careful. Obviously, anybody with uh, brittle bones, osteoporosis, you got to be careful with your training. Um, but the training really can be very effective. Arthritis. Um, again, you've got these charts on page seven, uh, 786, 787 that give you the basic guidelines and considerations for individuals with arthritis. We're getting into a little bit more you know, an area where uh, I'm not sure how many people you're going to actually see or deal with, with these conditions. Same thing, cancer, uh, pregnancy. Now, again, with pregnancy, it can, it can be, you know, you, you're, you're really juggling, it's a juggling act, but you're basically going by what the obstetrician is, is, is saying to their, uh, saying to their patient, which is, yeah, you can train for another week and then you're done. No more training. Pretty straightforward. And they will be more than more than capable of giving you the appropriate guidelines as a as a woman moves through her, the different different phases of pregnancy. Remember, uh, 
a pregnant woman um, has an increase in um, estrogen hormones, estradiol, and that actually softens and loosens up the ligaments. And that's why pregnant women can only train up to a certain point. They may feel strong. They may feel like they can do a ton of it, right? And they could. The only problem is, is that the increased level of, of certain hormones in their bodies actually makes it a little bit problematic because um, they could have injuries related to, to um, you know, the, um, uh, the softening of the ligaments. And uh, that's designed like that so that the pelvis can separate during pregnancy. So normally the doctors, the, uh, uh, the patient's doctor will basically give them up to a certain point and say, you know, you can walk, but no resistance training, no high intensity training, um, you know, just to keep your, keep your exercise up they would have them walk. So here's your, here's your training considerations for us and then guidelines, chronic lung disease. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I've ever dealt with people with chronic lung disease, but lots of people with, with asthma for sure, but just know, just know the basic considerations that you need to keep in mind um, as well as the uh, training guidelines. Okay. Um, intermittent, uh, claudication and peripheral PAD, peripheral artery, arterial disease. These are clinical issues for the most part. Um, if you do get clients that have these and you're actually going to train them, you're, you're asking the doctor and you're saying, look, tell me, you tell me, what should I do? What should I not do? But here are the, here are the training considerations um, that you would want to keep in mind as well as the, um, as well as the guidelines. For, um, for training. Again, just keep in mind, this, this entire chapter is really a bunch of tables, a bunch of tables that you're looking at, you're reading, the compilation makes it, makes it more formalized, makes it a lot easier to control your study efficiency. And uh, that's why chapter 23 um, could be a fairly, fairly straightforward, easy chapter to memorize the material. So just keep that in mind, go through your summary, uh, chapter review, of course, and then the and then the chapter highlights. And that is the end of the, of the NASM seventh edition textbook, of course. In Appendix A, they provide you assessment and programming templates. So just keep that in mind. They've been, uh, they've been really nice to you to give you all these, all these templates. Uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous resource right here in this appendix. So they give you a uh, part Q's lifestyle health history questionnaire. Utilize it. Once you become a NASM certified personal trainer, utilize their resources. They're excellent. Um, they're very helpful and uh, they make a lot of sense um, to use uh, once, you, once you become certified and you're actually training people. So that, that takes care of the, of the chapter 23 um, of the NASM 7th edition uh, textbook. Um, go through, obviously, um, each of those chapters, make sure that you're comfortable with the material um, and then utilize, obviously, through Appendix appendix A. And if you need to, of course, at the end of the textbook, NASM does provide you um, with, a, um, with an entire list of all the terms, where they can be found in a textbook and their definitions.